Tonight on Centennial Sportsnet, the Canadian baseball stars of tomorrow were shining bright down at Rogers Center. The amazing legacy of Terry Fox carried on across the GTA this weekend. Centennial's men's and women's soccer teams are looking for a little home cooking against Durham. And we close out the show with a feature on the Jays' late inning man, Roberto Osuna. Centennial Sportsnet, coming at you. Watch it. Welcome inside the studio, everyone. Kyle Enright here alongside my wonderful co-host, Lauren Maharaj. Lots to get to, but first, some more injury news out of the NFL. Tony Romo with a broken clavicle out eight weeks. Of course, that adds insult to injury on top of the Des Bryant broken foot out 10 weeks. And that wasn't even where the injury stopped. Yeah, and unfortunately, last week, midweek, during a Champions League game for Manchester United, they lost Luke Shaw, who broke his tibia in two different spots. And he'll probably be out for the entire season. Big blow for them. He was out last season, too. He's a promising young player, and uh, you know, but it's the nature of, of sports, and injuries happen. And that is, unfortunately, the nature of the beast in professional sports. But on a brighter note, we had some sports stars of tomorrow in semifinal action down at the Rogers Center, wrapping up the third annual Tournament 12 Baseball Showcase. And, of course, with the Blue Jays on the road, Rogers Center with, shall we say, a little less than 40 on hand. But the first of two semis goes between the boys in red from Alberta and next-door neighbors to the east, the Quebec Blue. Alberta sends the right-hander, Nick Cardinal, the Bonneville, Alberta native, to the mound, and he was dealing early. Cardinal catches Isaac DeVoe looking for one of his seven strikeouts on the day. Quebec counters with the southpaw, Vincent Beauregard, and he would match his counterpart early as he punches out Alberta catcher Jared Semenyuk. Beauregard also finishes with seven Ks on the day. Let's move to the bottom of the third inning and look who it is. Blue Jays Hall of Famer Roberto Alomar in attendance. At the dish now shortstop Aiden Huggins draws a walk and he'd show off some of that Alberta speed. He steals second and gets into scoring position but the West Coast boys best chance to put something on the board goes south quickly. Huggins is picked off on a bit of an awkward move by Beauregard to end the inning. Top six now. Isaac DeVoe back at the plate and he takes a borderline pitch. He steals second and advanced to third on the wild pitch. And Pierre Olivier Avon would hit one to left just out of the reach of shortstop. Huggins DeVoe comes in to score. Avon picks up the RBI single and a few batters later Marcel Maxime Lacasse belts a double down the line in left. Avon would come around to score. It's two zip Quebec flexing their muscles on offense. They tack on two more in the seventh and go up four. Alberta is now down to their final out and Cesar Valero grounds out to short. Quebec's Julian Edward makes the routine play to close it out. Quebec takes the first semifinal for zip. Alberta sent home after a dreadful semifinal. They leave 10 in scoring position on the day and that will certainly be a long flight home for the boys in red. Looking at the scoreboard, Cardinal picks up the loss for Alberta. He goes five and two thirds, giving up five hits, two runs, two earned runs, striking out seven. Right fielder Justin King goes two for three in the loss. And on the flip side, the lefty Beauregard picks up the W going four innings, striking out seven, and Oscar Rodriguez picks up the save. But moving to the second of two semis, Ontario Green up against the Prairie Purple. Righty Hunter Spoljarich on the bump for Ontario. The Prairies counter with a righty of their own six foot five, Carson Perkins. Top one, Ontario catcher Joe Tevlin gets a hold of one third base coach, waves around Owen Jansen, who comes in to score in Ontario. Goes up one zip quick, but hold on just a second. Bottom of one, Perks come right back. Saskatoon native Jordan Mullaney lines one into right center field. Two runs come around to score, and it may be early, but that's what we call timely hitting. Prairies go up 2-1. Move to the second inning, and Mullaney is at it again. This kid is straight up falling right now. This time up, he goes and gets a hold and bringing one home. Another run. Perps go up 3-1, bottom of three now, and Sam Turcott into the game in relief of Spoljarich, who got roughed up in this one. Four runs on five hits. He only lasted two innings in this game. Turcott looking to stop the bleeding and what more can you ask for if you're Ontario? He catches Prairie's outfielder Jeremy Godris swinging. Let's jump to the sixth and Ontario looking to come back. The Oakville boy Nick Howie rips one to third thanks to an airmail throw. Would reach second on the throwing air and next up is Ryan Rijo who had arguably the best performance of anyone in tournament 12. He'd stay hot and line one to left. One run comes in to score. It's 5-2 Prairies. 
seventh and final inning and a reminder these games are only seven innings long so Ontario is down to their final out and Andrew Lego a little late on this swing will pop it up to second and the Prairies take the second semifinal 5-2 and advance to the final Perkins picks up the win for the Perps he goes four innings giving up just three hits and one earned run striking out four Mullaney with two RBI and despite the Prairies picking up just five hits on the day the Prairies went on to play Quebec Blue in the tournament 12 final and as we look at that scoreboard the boys from Saskatchewan and Manitoba would go on to take it in a pitcher's duel one zip is the final Zach Demchenko goes the distance in a complete game shutout giving up just three hits and striking out eight in the process perps outfielder Brad Resch picks up the lone RBI in the win for Quebec a great effort by the blue William Sierra goes five innings giving up one run and striking out five on the day and after the game I spoke with Centennial's baseball insider Ali Khan ref Johnny on the field at Rogers Center after the tournament. Kyle Enright, field level here with our baseball insider, Ali Khan, Ref Johnny, and Ali Khan. As this tournament has wrapped up, what is next for these baseball players and their new bright futures? Well, Kyle, for a lot of these young players, it's their first real exposure on the baseball stage. Some of them are going to be drafted in the upcoming draft, and others will get noticed by Division I and Division II schools. It's safe to say there's a bright future ahead for a lot of these young baseball stars. And just building on that, it's obviously a new mentality for these baseball players playing in front of scouts, not only in front of their parents, but now they're having to decide what schools they're going to go to, if they're going to commit, if they're going to enter the draft. Um, the mindset of these baseball players coming out of this now, has it altered from when they started? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that, Kyle. We were talking to a lot of these players earlier in the day, and many of them started baseball later in life. For a lot of them, they're two- and three-sport athletes. This gives them the exposure to really put baseball as the sport that they want to do for their career. A lot of them grew up as hockey players or basketball players. Now they're noticed by major league scouts. They're noticed by people that can help them alter not only, th not only their future in baseball, but also their future in terms of education and getting a scholarship. Now obviously this tournament is run by Roberto Alomar. And with talent like Alomar and Lloyd Mosby in the stands, do you think there's an added pressure for these players to put on, say, a bigger performance in front of these guys that are you know, along the level of excellence here at Rogers Center? Well, these kids come here, they, they're at the park where the Blue Jays play. A lot of them growing up, big fans of the Blue Jays, they see their heroes on that level of excellence, and we've seen the performances that they've put up. We've seen anything from six scoreless innings to two-run walk-off home runs. All of these things that are magnifying these athletes as players and also as people and bringing them together as a team, which is why this tournament is ultimately so successful. It was another fantastic showcase here at Rogers Center, the T12 tournament in fine form as always. From St. John's, Newfoundland to Thunder Bay, Ontario, Terry Fox ran close to 42 kilometers a day during his Marathon of Hope in the early 80s. His goal of raising money for cancer research still lives on 30 years later, and today we have a special double report for you with our very own Marta Crook on the two races that happened in Markham and the beaches this weekend. Let's take a look. From one hemisphere to another, from Canada to the UK, to Kenya to Qatar, people run to support and honour those who have been afflicted with cancer. I am now 17 years cancer free, which is a really special place to be and I definitely attribute that to a lot of the research done by the Terry Fox Foundation, started and influenced by Terry's journey and I think he's really inspired a lot of people to do some really great work. Hi, I'm joined with Brida Mabu. She has worked with the Terry Fox Foundation for the last 28 years. Brida, how did you get started and what was your motivation? Uh, I got started when I saw Terry running uh, down University Avenue in 1980. And when I saw what he was doing, uh, I was motivated myself that one day I would be able to do, to contribute my share as well. From the very beginning, including his marathon of hope, where he raised 24.17 million in total in 35 years, uh, 700 million dollars has been raised in Canada and in over 50 countries around the world. There are 220 locations in Ontario alone, with an expected turnout of 80 to 90 thousand people. When Terry was diagnosed with cancer, when he was 17 years old. He had a 50% chance of surviving. Today, 35 years later, it is 80%. And people who have that type of cancer, bone cancer, do not lose their limbs. They don't lose their arms or their legs. So thanks to Terry Fox, 
amazing, amazing advances have been made in the area of cancer research. Terry is phenomenal. Like, he's my hero. I think about him every day. When I have a bad day, I think about him. I think if he can do it, I can do this. You know, it makes the small things work manageable. Um, yeah, so for me, he's like a guiding light. I love him. Starting this year, due to the immense popularity of the run in Ontario, the province will recognize the second Sunday of September as Terry Fox Day. Thanks to the passion of all the volunteers, 90% of the money raised goes towards cancer research. Each and every morning, without a word of a lie, I wake up and I open my front door and I look at the blue sky and I look at the green grass and I am just so grateful and so thankful. I've done a lot of community work and I more or less dropped all of that for this. This is the foundation. Like, they're a family. They don't, you know, I've never found a group of people like the Terry Fox Foundation. I love them. I'm passionate about it, and so are they, and that's what makes it so much fun. I wrote a few mission statements for myself, and here are some of them. Be brave. Be strong. Be positive. Be grateful. Be thankful. Keep believing. And above all, keep having faith. Record-breaking returns for the 35th anniversary run have already been reported, and it looks like the most successful year yet. Can you me in your silence? Next on Centennial Sportsnet, we come back. When we come back, the men's and women's cold soccer team get mixed results in their home openers. And our very own Joe Narsa goes on site and interviews Leafs prospect Lucas Parasini. Don't go away. For 90 seconds, and in this week's episode, we put a twist on an old American classic beverage. That's right, I'm talking about the rum and coke. All right, next up, the also pouring of the booze. Now notice how this bottle is aged eight years. We're not messing around. This is not your run-of-the-mill Captain Morgan's. No, we're going to step it up a little bit and have some Bacardi. Splash. And here's the twist of the classic we've been talking about. You want to rim your rum and coke with an extra large wedge of grapefruit. It really is a great garnish on a summer day. And that's all we have time for today, folks, on how to be successful in 90 seconds. The Centennial women's soccer team endured a sour start to their season, losing against the Durham Lords at home on Saturday, while the men's team had a reason to celebrate as they beat the same college 2-1 to one in a match filled with drama and slippery pitch conditions. Let's take a look at the highlights from both matches, but first, we'll start with the ever-so-unlucky ladies. The Durham Lords are looking to take the field and win their third of the season here. The Centennial Colts, on the other hand, are hoping to avoid starting the year 0-4. and four. Not a great start for the Colts as an early lead leaves an opportunity for Taylor Lord and the Lords. Nice and early chance is taken, but for the Colts, luckily it's not converted. The replay will show Miriam Sara de la Sonimez get the ball and steer it wide. And there's some highlight material here as Ashley Weisbach lays the ball off for Taylor McGee, who dribbles past Molly Fitzgerald. And it's so nice, we just had to show you three times. She sends the ball to Shalina Ackerman, and she would deke out the keeper and tap that baby into the net. It's 1-0 Lords, and it's not looking good for the home side. The replay here will show Ackerman's move in the box to beat the keeper, and it is a beauty. It's the second half here, and the Colts crowd are looking to get their team back into the game. Daniela Calarigi looks to build momentum for the Colts by sending the ball towards the box. Fitzgerald lays it off for Nahika Harrison, who takes a shot on goal, but Jessica Protuka is up to the task. Kayla Hellam clears the ball, but McGee steals the ball on a centennial throw-in attempt. She charges towards the goal and takes a shot that's stopped by the keeper. But the rebound falls in front of Sarah Blasia, who scores with a high shot off the crossbar, and it's 2-0 Lords. And that would be the final score as the Lords improve 3-1 on the road. The Colts would remain winless and sit at 7th place. They take on Al Algonquin next weekend, who are 4-0 at home. And the Lords will face Loyalists, who are 0-2 on the road.
Now the soccer action doesn't stop here as we take you to a home opener between the men's game. We start off with Corey Digimi Goody lining up a corner for the Colts. Poor clearance attempt by the Lords leads to a chance for the Colts in the box, but a weak header is handled by the Lords keeper, Jonathan Codring Codrington. Lords looking to steal momentum in this game. Carter Donnelly sends in a perfect free kick that finds Tevin Noel Peterson, who lays it off for unmarked Javin Brown and puts it past the Colts keeper. It's 1-0 Lords. The away side look to continue to continue the pressure here as Sasa Vokoji Vok prepares for a Lords corner. But Katrovis stands tall for the Colts to keep their deficit at just one. The replay here shows the Colts keeper making two big saves to keep that ball out of the net. Yet Mother Nature decides to intervene in the game as the clouds open up. Nobody was safe from the rain as the players were slipping and sliding on the pitch. And unfortunately, by halftime, pretty much everybody at the game was soaked. But spirits stayed high as the Colts faithful hoped to provide a spark for the team going into the final 45. And they are beating that table with all of their might. It's the second half now, and here we go. The game is tied at one, and the Lords were looking for a go-ahead goal. But Katrobis was there to meet Austin McDonald before he could get a shot off. In stoppage time, E. Kenna Nikowacha's header proves to be the difference, and that late goal beats the Lords Codrington to the delight of the Centennial fans, and Katrobis, who is ecstatic at the other end of the pitch. The Colts take it by that score of two to one as they earn their first win of the season, and the Lords, on the other hand, would fall 0-2-1 on their campaign. You'd be hard-pressed to find a Canadian kid who doesn't have the aspirations of making it to the NHL. 5 a.m. wake-ups for ice time, that smell from the hockey bag that can make the dog queasy. They do all of it in hopes of being noticed and hopefully grabbing a roster spot. But it's tough. The pros are no easy feat, especially for goaltenders. Centennial's Joe Narsa had a chance to sit down with Kingston Frontenac's netminder, Lucas Parasini, and talk to him about his hockey journey and the ups and downs that go along with it. Lucas Parasini from Nobleton, Ontario. My favorite team growing up was the Toronto Maple Leafs, and uh, my favorite player right now is Carey Price. I was a Leaf fan growing up my whole life and I always watched them on Saturday night so it's always been a dream of mine to play for them and uh, hopefully I could play well this weekend and you know maybe some day down the road I could end up playing for the Leafs. It was definitely a weird experience you know like I said you know I watched them my whole life the Leafs and uh, always wanted to put on that jersey and um, I think it was Friday night I was able to and you know it was definitely a dream come true. I had a bunch of different offers, uh, but the uh, Maple Leafs, you know, they have a good organization. They have great goalie coaches here, good coaching staff. And uh, talking to my agent, he likes the th way things are going to be run around here, you know, with uh, obviously Brendan Shanahan at the top and uh, Kyle Dubas handling the contracts and obviously with the hiring of Mike Babcock. That uh, it's definitely an attractive option for a lot of OHL players or NCAA players looking to uh, come to camp. You've seen a couple of these guys, but maybe one person you haven't seen or someone, even if you have, that's really stood out to you that while you're there, you're just like, man, this guy, he's special. Yeah, i say definitely uh, William Nylander. You know, I haven't seen him play too much, but I got to see him play this weekend. And, uh, you know, he's gonna, definitely going to be a treat for Toronto fans to watch these next couple of years. You know, he's a special player. Um, even Mitch Marner, those two together are going to be uh, great for Toronto. What did you do last season to push your game to the next level? Um, to start it off, um, I wanted to work hard every day in practice and uh, really work on stopping every puck every day, which helped translate to the game. Also, we have uh, great goalie coaches in Kingston who uh, we watch a video with and uh, work on my game. Did you have a bit of a chip on your shoulder going into last year, you know, going undrafted and then coming into training camp? Was that at all something that did push you? Yeah, maybe a little. I had something to prove even in Kingston. You know, they didn't know if I could uh, handle a starting job. So I definitely wanted to prove it to the staff there, and uh, you know I was able to do that all year. How disheartening was it to not ultimately be on that World Junior team? Uh, it's not something I ever expected. So, you know, like I said, they had two great goalies. There's a lot of goalies to be picked from in Canada, and obviously they made the right decision. They won gold, so you know they know what they're doing there. Where would you like to see yourself end up? Uh, I think it's a realistic goal to uh, 
get a NHL contract, an entry level deal, and um, play for the Marlies. I think that's uh, my ultimate goal coming over this weekend. Coming up next on Centennial Sportsnet, Osuna, Alomar, a couple of Robertos. We got the chance to sit down and talk to the closer and the Hall of Famer. That and more after the break. Are you bored at home? Tired of staying in on a Friday night with no plans? Well, the Third and Long Hotline is here for you. We have operators standing by 24-7 to answer all your hottest and deepest fantasy football questions. Don't have a cell phone? Stuck at work? Is traffic too heavy on the local newspaper website? Call our toll-free number. What do you have to lose? Call now, 1-888-555-6969. Our experts can help you determine who to start, sit, stash, or quit. What's your fantasy? Was that you, Kyle? That's is not important and frankly kind of embarrassing but what is important is why people play professional sports and sure you can say it's about the money and for some it probably is just take a look at seattle seahawks safety cam chancellor but for others they want to be great for toronto it's been a while since we've seen competitive baseball this late in the year the last time was of course in 92 and 93 players like carter steve and alomar were the hometown heroes Roberto Alomar goes down as arguably the greatest Blue Jay to ever suit up. And while most recognize him for his great double plays or his clutch hitting, his love for the game of baseball and developing kids is something to marvel at. I had the chance to catch up with Alomar at his Tournament 12 and talk to him about this tournament and his continued success in Canadian baseball. Kyle Enright here along with Ali Khan Rafjani and a very special guest, a very familiar face within these walls, Hall of Fame second baseman Roberto Alomar. And Roberto, a very successful T12 so far. What stood out to you so far with these young guys? So far it's been great. Yeah, it's, it's uh, an opportunity for the, for the young guys to, to come here and, show, and uh, showcase their, their skills. They're doing a great job. This is our third year doing it and uh, I feel real proud of uh, all the guys. Roberto, of course, three years now, three very successful years. You've seen players that have been drafted. You've seen players that have gone on to Division I schools. What are some of the factors and reasons that this tournament has been so successful and that it's continued to grow and prosper? Well, it seems like uh, it's because, uh, you know, it's part of the Blue Jays, uh, knowing that, uh, that, you know, we, the, the coaches, the alumni guy who, who play the game of baseball, they're, they're great teachers. And uh, when uh, some of the kids know who, who's going to be part of the tournament 12. I think the kids get excited and want to be part of this tournament. Uh, it's, 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 it's great for the kids. It's great for the baseball in Canada. And uh, we're just uh, so happy to have this tournament. Obviously a very special moment for these guys to showcase their talent, not only for scouts, but also for their parents. Um, obviously you know a thing or two about successful Blue Jay teams. Do you think it's a little bit more special for them this year, given how good the Blue Jays are doing, to play on this field? Well, I, I believe it. Yeah, it is, and uh, it, and it, it is special because it's it's really, you know, when I when I when I was their age, I had dreams and expectations of mm -hmm. myself, and uh, I always wanted to be uh, a big league ball player. That was my dream. So, this is a step more towards 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 their dream if, if hopefully they make it, and uh, it helps a lot that the Blue Jays are playing real well, mm -hmm. and uh, we're winning, and hopefully. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the Blue Jays can, can uh, keep winning uh, and hopefully we can go all the way to the World Series. Mm -hmm. Roberto, last question. You've talked about the success of the teams. You were there the last time this team was so successful and you have other guys joining you here like Lloyd Mosby, Dwayne Ward, Devon White, people that have volunteered their time, sacrificed their time to do something like this. What does it mean for the kids? You, you briefly touched on it, but what does it really mean for them to have them help coach them, teach them things, just talk to them and, and talk about their success as well to help these kids dream big? Well, I think it helps a lot. Not, not only, you know, uh, and it helps them, it helps me. Uh, I'm real proud to have that, that, uh, that support, you know, with Lloyd, my dad, uh, you know, Mario Diaz, uh, Devon White, Dwayne Ward, and many others. 
I think it's always nice to, to have the alumni come back to Toronto and get back to the community. And they, they have done a great job. But uh, also, we have, to, we have to be thankful for the Blue Jays organization, you know, the J.K.R. Foundation, who have helped us a lot for this tournament. And, uh, and we just want, all, all we want to do, the idea of this tournament, is just to, to, to give uh, an opportunity for the, for the young who are ready to go to the next level. Obviously, with Roberto's help, along with others, another successful T12 tournament and Canadian baseball is alive and well. The closer job for the Blue Jays was bouncing around until it found a home with youngster Roberto Osuna. The 20-year-old made 16 saves this season so far, but the pressure is mounting on him as the season begins to wind down. Our very own Alexis Espejo was at the Jays game against the Red Sox on Sunday, where he had a chance to chat with the promising young star. Let's take a look. We took the time to speak with Roberto Osuna and also with the manager John Gibbons about the season that the 20-year-old pitcher from Mexico has been having with the Blue Jays as a closer. And also we had the time to speak about how Osuna became one of the top candidates towards the American League Rookie of the Year award. Here's what he had to say. Oh, it's been great, you know, being around uh, all these guys and uh, trying to learn as much as I can. It's been a great experience and uh, this guy has been doing a, a great job, you know, all the team and, and, and especially me, so happy to be here. Wow, you know, uh, He's been, he's been incredible, you know, to think that he's he's the youngest player in the major leagues in really the one of the toughest roles in baseball, being the, being the closer. You know, I, I really, I, you know, I can't say enough good things about, how, you know, how, how well he's performed and how he's handled it. You know, he's he's mature beyond his age. Well, excited, you know, and uh, we got a great team. We got a, a, gay, uh, a great players, and, uh, and the support we've been uh, receiving from the fans is, is unbelievable. I mean, and uh, it's a great support. We are playing really well right now. Just we gotta keep doing what we've been doing and uh, try to make the playoff. First year in the big leagues and uh, make the playoff and get the chance to be to uh, win the World Series is unbelievable. Well, you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of things, uh, but uh, the most important thing right now is uh, help the team to win. We're trying to make the playoff to go to the World Series and then I worry about the Rookie of the Year. I'm just trying to do my job, trying to do the best as I can and try to help the team win. That's it. You know, he's he's in a lot of ways he saved us. You know, filling that role because we were kind of bouncing around guys in the closer's role, couldn't come up with one. Then gave him an opportunity. He's run with it, and he's been as good as anybody. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's still being baseball, you know. And uh, you got to make a good pitches. You got to get him out of the way, and uh, you know, I try to see him as a normal person, like a normal baseball guy. And uh, just try to do my job. Anything different? Well, you know, especially being the youngest player in the, in the big leagues, you know, talent alone doesn't necessarily give you success at this level you mean you have to be mentally tough and confident he, he he has all that you know he believes in himself so much it doesn't matter who's standing in the batter's box he thinks he can get him out and he's it, there's been so many times this year he's made the best players in baseball look bad and uh you know he's got a bright bright future he's going to pitch in this league a long long time and and uh, I mean, even more than that you know he's a good guy you know he, he's 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 popular in the clubhouse. He's one of those guys, you know, you, you look forward to seeing every day. No, I mean, it's great, you know, uh, face your your favorite baseball players, you know, got the opportunity to meet him and uh, have a conversation with them. He's uh, one of the of the big blessings you're always going to receive from God. With only 20 years old and being the youngest player in the league, Roberto Osuna has shown to the Blue Jays organization that he's ready to take the closer job for the future. For Centennial Sportsnet, Alexis Espejo. Well, Lauren, that is another wrap on a great week of sports. And in fantasy world, I got to give a big shout out to Julio Jones and Antonio Brown. Boys, once again, bringing me to the top. A fantastic week for myself in fantasy football. But Lauren, what are you looking forward to this weekend? You know what? I'm always looking forward to European fixtures all over that continent um, for, for soccer, EPL, Syria, Liga, everything but I think my big one is Aston Villa against my Liverpool boys. because it's it's related to you so absolutely and that and it's going to unfortunately do it for us on this episode I'm Kyle she's Lauren that's it for us thanks for watching